Good morning, everyone. We know that communication is always important. It involves a transmitter and a receiver. In a face-to-face -face communication, if you want to try to tell me something, you need to be within my hearing distance. As we are the fur apart from each other as the distance grows, oftentimes we want to rely on some additional helps. Sometimes it's also involving other species. But what if we cannot afford the extra latency? What if we need to maintain the nature of this real-time information transfer? Fortunately, throughout human civilization, we learned several techniques that allows us to do so. For a start, we start to rely on our eyes and less on our voice and our ears. We can convert the information into some sort of coded message and use any kind of signal system. Everything from smoke signals to fire beacons or semaphore. Still, over a great distance, if you're on the receiver end, you need to have these bionic eyes with superhuman vision. What if we can shift the responsibility to the transmitter? What if the transmitter projects the information to the receiver? This is the whole idea behind heliograph. A focus ray, typically from the sunlight, is reflected by a mirror in the transmitter, modulated by a signal, for example, Morse code, and sent down to the receiver, a spot close to the receiver. Morse code is not always fun. This is why Alexander Graham Bell, best known for his invention telephone, came up with a different idea. He called it photophone. Remember, this was back in 1880s. Madison Square Garden was open for the first time, and America Civil War just ended. Photophone works very similar like a telephone. Instead of electricity, he was using light. His voice modulates light source sent to the receiver and converted back to the audio. With the technology available at that time, he managed to transmit his voice via light over a distance of 700 feet. This is quite profound, this is remarkable. This is a milestone in the history of wireless voice communication. Bell was so fascinated by Photophone. If it wasn't for his wife's intervention, he would have named his second daughter after it. Photophone heliograph, they belong to this free space optical communication system. It suffers from two problems. First, line of sight is crucial, so you, you can only communicate in straight line. Second, the medium itself is extremely lossy. It's hardly surprising that it's hard to maintain a communication link over a great distance. This is why electricity won the battle for the next hundred years. People just started to use telegraph and later on telephone. It wasn't until about 50 years ago that optical communication gained traction again. It was for the invention of laser. Now, if you grew up in the 90s and read comic books, you know that laser is pretty amazing. In real life, laser is much more than just this powerful and destructive weapon. Laser is different than any other light source. For start, it's highly monochromatic. It exhibits one single pure color. If you put the prism behind it, there won't be any rainbow. One color, one frequency, one wavelength. That also means all the photons, the particle of light, carries the same amount of energy. On top of that, laser is also extremely coherent. All the rays, they do not cross each other as they travel. All the waveform are in perfect sync. This allows us to build an optical interferometer, a crucial component in any high-sensitive optical receiver. Being monochromatic and being coherent, sets laser up as the perfect carrier for any modern optical communication system. Another achievement that we've done is fiber optic. It's made of silica glass, it's very light, it's low cost in maintenance. In many aspects, it's superior than copper wire. If you cut the fiber optic cable, the cross section looks like this. The jackets and buffer are there for the protection, but the magic happened inside that core. It's eight micron of silica glass. The thinnest strain of your hair is already 16. This is just half of it. Thanks to the difference in the refractive index between the core and the cladding, this establishes an optical phenomenon called the total internal reflection. If you launch a photon into that 8 micron of silica glass, it gets trapped there forever. If you launch a photon from this place to the JFK airport and come back again, it's going to lose most of its power. Only 1% remains. But thanks to modern optical receiver, that's 1%, it's necessary, it's sufficient to recover all the formations. No amplification necessary, no booster needed. Imagine doing this with electricity and copper wire, it's just impossible. This is why 
our internet backbone relies on this massive network of undersea fiber optic cable all over the world. In fact, live streaming of this keynote, this conference, will not be possible if it's not for millions of photons flying around in these tiny little tubes. If you think of internet as a series of tubes, there is some truth to it. If you choose one cable from this place to Europe, it has this staggering amount of capacity, 3.2 terabit per second. How much is 3.2 terabit per terabit? It's a, essentially the content of a stack of Blu-ray discs. How fast is 3.2 terabit per second? Imagine that entire content appears across the pond somewhere in Europe in just a second. How do we achieve this? Compared to Bell's experiment uh, years ago, today we have the luxury of modulating several different attributes of light. We can modulate its amplitude, its frequency, and its phase. Combining all these aspects allows us to multiply the total capacity of any photonics transmission system. It gets even better. I mentioned earlier that laser is monochromatic. There's almost zero overlap between one frequency and another. In other words, we can launch four different signals, like in this diagram, that has four different frequencies of the carriers. Launch into the same, same single fiber optic, no chance in the installation necessary, and then at the receiver end, we can demux that and get the individual channel. This diagram shows four, but in practice, we can have as many as 10 or 20 or 40. Once we start to get into this high bit rate, we start to be facing the, the law of physics. There will be some impairments, uh, and that decreases the signal quality. Take, for example, a chromatic dispersion. This causes pulse burdening, so one bit will not be easily distinguishable from another one. But rest assured, some of the brightest minds in our industry work really hard to solve this problem, and the result speaks for itself. Today, for our undersea fiber optic communication system, we have a base bit rate of 10 gigabit per second, but we start to see a deployment of 100 and 200. And why stop there? When we start to modify the medium itself to improve the state of the fabrication of the fiber optic cables, we can have 255 terabit per second. Are we going to see terabit per second or exabit per second anytime soon? Only time will tell. It was barely 150 years ago when Bell struggled with his voice transmission over light. Low signal quality, low bandwidth, short distance. But thanks to the hard work of all the scientists in the last 100 years, everyone from physicists to mathematicians, optical communication has transformed the way we communicate. It has transformed our civilization. Today, we can talk to anyone on this planet, wherever they are, whenever we like. If you know someone who's a scientist, you owe it to yourself to give them a hug. A big hug. We have to remember that we stand on the shoulder of the giants, the men and the women before us. It is therefore in our best interest to show our gratitude, to be thankful, and to stay humble. Thank you.